The following is a special presentation of s Media, LLC, copyright 2019. The content of this episode, including the theme song that is licensed to s Media, has been reviewed by our internal legal department and been found to comply with YouTube's terms of use and community guidelines. The hosts are not healthcare providers and nothing in this podcast should be construed as medical advice. Safe and Effective Podcast with your host, Levi Quackenboss, with Studio Cat and Miranda Braverman on Science. Now, this is Levi Quackenboss. Good morning, good evening, whenever and wherever you are listening. We are so glad you have joined us for the inaugural episode one of the Safe and Effective Podcast. Now, if you're not already, go ahead and start following the Safe and Effective Podcast on Twitter. So our Twitter handle, you're going to go to at safe underscore effective and start following us there. Also, we are going to be tweeting the link to this week's full-length episode, which is going to take you to our YouTube channel. Now, once you're there on the YouTube channel, we need you to do a couple of things. We need you to subscribe to the channel, and this is important that we need you to do that. You're going to be notified once you're subscribed. You'll be notified when new content gets posted, and we will start to become easier to find when other people start searching for our channel name on YouTube. All right? So right now, the name of the channel is The Safe and Effective Podcast. That's on YouTube. But it doesn't show up right now every time when you search it because it's so new. We are here in the beautiful Safe and Effective Studios this week. Uh, I'm looking up in the corner and it does look like that the Safe and Effective webcam is down right now. So it looks like we're not going to have video of us here in the Safe and Effective studio this week. But my hope is, my understanding is the Safe and Effective engineering team is working tirelessly to get that fixed. So hopefully we'll have that video of us up and working for next week's show. Now, we are going to have a bit of this week's show uploaded on Facebook and YouTube that will have some video that will go along with the broadcast, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Now, joining me in the Safe and Effective studio this week, I want to introduce a dopey-looking calico cat that's currently sleeping in the west window. I'm not exactly sure what the value add for her is to the show, but I guess we're going to take a wait-and-see approach to that. Also joining me in all things research and science to the Safe and Effective podcast, as well as consultant to the Levi Quackenboss blog, Twitter feed, and countless other things. Hello, Miranda Braverman. How are you today? Hello, Levi. I'm good. How are you? I'm really good. Are you fired up about today's show? Levi, I gotta say, I can't believe we're still talking about this kid. Yeah, we're going to be talking a lot about the kid. Uh, We already talked a lot about the kid, and we're going to talk a little more so that everyone knows exactly what's going on. So let's talk a little bit about what we really hope to accomplish with this platform. As some of you already know, the Levi Quackenboss blog is the best place to hear my thoughts and insights into all things medical and health news related. Now, if you're not already a member, I want you to go to patreon.com forward slash Quackenboss. That's patreon.com forward slash Quackenboss and join the blog. Why am I doing a podcast? Well, I have been wanting to do a podcast to talk about really important things in my life, like my workouts and my fantasy football team. I really wanted to do it for a long time, and I was talking to Miranda about it, and she showed virtually zero interest in doing that, and I didn't totally understand that. But, you know, back in March, there was a lot of stuff going on. There was a hearing in Washington, D.C. There was this kid that they brought forward that we were told was the new chosen one, the new way it was going to be when it came to 
teenagers and children deciding that they were going to fight against their parents and start getting themselves vaccinated. And I think at that point, I looked over at Miranda and I said, you know what, maybe we actually do a podcast about the blog I've been writing about vaccines. And you, I think, made some comment like, yes, of course, that would be a lot better than fantasy football. (laughs) And I said, I don't know if that's true, but we can try. As far as format, I think for now, it's probably going to be mostly Miranda and I talking about these issues. You know, someday, I think we might have guests, but I think for the time being, let's be honest, once you've heard from me and Miranda, you pretty much have all the facts that you need. (laughs) Why are you laughing? That's so true. And that seems like a pretty good segue into the topic of today's show, what we're calling the Lindenberger hoax. Now, we have really, really good reason to believe and really good evidence to support this hypothesis of ours that our vaccine skeptical community, the overall public, and even a Senate committee was duped. We don't know 100% that all of it is dead on perfectly accurate with what happened and what these people's motives may be. But we believe reasonable people listening to this, looking at the evidence, will draw a similar conclusion from the facts that are gonna be laid out. So let's take a quick break. When we come back, we're gonna break down for you the timeline the evidence, what we think is likely going on with the Lindenburgers, and please know that all the photographs and videos and articles and everything will be on the video at YouTube. We're back from break, and you're listening to the Safe and Effective Podcast. I am your host, Levi Quackenboss, alongside science correspondent Miranda Braverman. If you're just joining us, then you're listening to the short version of this podcast, and you should check out the full episode for more conversation and a special bonus at the end. You can find us on Twitter by searching at safe underscore effective, where we'll pin the link to our extended YouTube video. Once you find our YouTube channel, the Safe and Effective Podcast, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on future content. Today, we're bringing you a special edition called The Lindenberger Hoax. As many Americans know, the Ethan Lindenberger story is the tale of a high school senior raised by an anti-vax mother who took to Reddit to ask the world how to get himself vaccinated. As far as America knew, it was only three weeks from the time Ethan's Reddit post was discovered until he was testifying as a witness before the U.S. Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions in a hearing called Vaccines Save Lives. Ethan had catapulted at supersonic speeds from a relatively obscure online magazine to being featured on national morning news shows, taking selfies with the U.S. Surgeon General, meeting with Twitter executives about censoring vaccine information, speaking at the United Nations, and having his very own TED Talk about the whole ordeal. In order to understand the solutions that the Ethan Lindenberger hoax brought to the CDC, as well as its captor and the most profitable vaccine manufacturer in America, GlaxoSmithKline, you have to understand the problems they were facing. The number one issue for the CDC was that the Trump administration slashed its budget by $1.4 billion for fiscal year 2019, which put them at a whopping 20% under what they spent the year before. Early into 2019, the CDC was aiming to get that money back. The wrench in their plans was that somehow the country had functioned just fine for the first eight months of the fiscal year while the CDC was on that tighter budget, so they needed to create a public health crisis where there was none. That's why, on January 17th, the World Health Organization named vaccine hesitancy as one of their 10 global threats to health. The second problem facing the CDC was that the number of American two-year-olds who received no vaccines at all had risen by 44% in recent years, in no small part because of the stories of vaccine injury and death that circulate on Facebook. When it comes to covering the stories of mothers who lost their infants just hours and days after vaccination, nobody comes close to the volume of content that is published on Larry Cook's Stop Mandatory Vaccination website. Of course, the U.S. government can't overtly ask a web hosting provider to take down someone's site about dead babies. That would be an obvious violation of the First Amendment. So, the government and pharma designed a workaround, asking Facebook to create rules to demote, hide, monitor, and eventually ban the Facebook group where these stories are launched. 
with 167,000 members. The Stop Mandatory Vaccination Group is the largest vaccine education group on Facebook. The vaccine misinformation narrative was launched two weeks before Ethan's story, with the release of a report from the Royal Society for Public Health. That report claimed that half of all parents with small children have been exposed to vaccine misinformation on social media. While the report didn't specifically mention Larry Cook and stop mandatory vaccination, the media who covered the report, including The Guardian, did. If half of new parents were seeing vaccine injury stories on Facebook, they were reading about sudden infant death babies on Larry's site. The third thorn in Pharma's side is that American parents have been almost universally rejecting the two-dose series of HPV vaccine for their kids and teens. In January of 2019, only 16% of American 13-year-olds had been fully vaccinated against HPV. This number is abysmal by pharma standards. It's clear the biggest obstacle between teenagers and the HPV vaccine is a well-informed parent. Pharmaceutical companies know that if they can get the age of consent for vaccination lowered to 11 or 12 in every state across the country, kids can get a medical appointment without their parents knowing. Once out of their parents' protection, children will be vulnerable to coercion by healthcare providers. They are likely to consent to anything deemed a teen vaccine, and vaccine sales and compliance rates will rise. The moment the Ethan Lindenberger story was released, headlines screamed about children's rights to get vaccinated without their parents' permission. The Lindenberger hoax was full of possibilities for the CDC and vaccine manufacturers' problems. Ethan could be used to create a public health crisis based on parents receiving vaccine misinformation on Facebook. This would spur both Facebook to dismantle the group that was launching these stories about babies being killed by vaccines and give the CDC justification for asking for a 22% raise. Plus, he was a perfect example of a studious teen who had earned the right to get vaccinated before he turned 18, if only his state had allowed it. The story of the Lindenberger hoax features three main players. Ethan, the good little boy who showed his parents the light about science, his well-intentioned but desperately misinformed mother Jill, and his conspiracy-loving, government-distrusting brother Isaac. If this family didn't already exist, Pharma would have had to invent them. Ethan Lindenberger is an 18-year-old high school senior, debate club president, and Dungeons & Dragons den master who wants to enter the ministry for a career as a pastor. According to Ethan, his own youth pastor suggested that he get himself vaccinated, spurring one of the most viral stories of 2019. Rather than ask his pastor where to get vaccinated, on November 16, 2018, Ethan posted on the Reddit No Stupid Questions board asking people how and where he could get vaccinated. My parents are kind of stupid and don't believe in vaccines, it began. It is glaringly obvious that this Reddit narrative was professionally reshaped and rewritten before Ethan hit primetime on February 6th. Missing from Ethan's Reddit post are any references to Andrew Wakefield, Facebook, and any other social media, as well as his mother's alleged online activism. In his post, Ethan blamed his far-right and uneducated parents who were being fed lies by the media, creating their stance on vaccination. Now, I do think Ethan's Reddit post was genuine. I feel this way because Ethan said something in a comment that he attributed to his high school vice principal. I called that vice principal, and he confirmed to me it was true. If that comment is true, it is probably also true that Ethan feels his parents are far right, and certainly true that Ethan sees them as uneducated and stupid. But most importantly, when Ethan made the post, it was his understanding, rightly or wrongly, that his parents were getting their vaccine risk information from mainstream news or television, not social media. Obviously, this fact does not make a public health crisis, so it has been omitted from all coverage, interviews, and testimony. Instead, beginning in February, Ethan started telling the media that his mother got her vaccine information from Facebook. He has repeatedly said that it was when he witnessed people arguing with her and correcting her and proving her wrong in the comments on her videos and articles that he first learned that his parents' opinions of vaccines were wrong. On March 5th, Ethan testified to the U.S. Senate committee that his mother is an anti-vax advocate. And my mother is an anti-vax advocate that believes vaccines cause autism, brain damage, and do not benefit the health and safety of society. People would try and counterclaim with her and argue online people would tell her that her videos were incorrect. Both online and in person, she would voice her concerns, and these beliefs were met with strong criticism. Over the course of my life, seeds of doubts were planted and questions arose because of the the backlash my mother would receive. 
as I would see people, uh, I suppose, uh, try and counterclaim with her and argue online. I would see that she would have these, uh, these, this backlash as she would share information. So on Facebook, she'd share a video and people would be like, that's incorrect, this is false. Ethan's testimony was preceded by the first witness, Dr. Wiesman, from the Washington State Department of Health. The Association of State and Territorial Health Officials and over 80 organizations are asking you to raise the CDC budget by 22% by FY22. Dr. Wiesman pleaded for the government to grant the CDC a 22% budget increase as well as authorize a national vaccine campaign, led by the CDC of course, to counter the anti-vaccine messages. He said that the situation is urgent. We need federal leadership for a national vaccine campaign spearheaded by CDC in partnership with states that counter the anti-vaccine messages, similar to the successful Truth Tobacco Prevention Campaign. We have lost much ground. Urgent action is necessary. It isn't clear if a PR professional found Ethan on Reddit in November. He may have been contacted directly by the CDC, a pharmaceutical company, or a media group fronting for pharma. What we do know is that by the time Ethan received his first round of vaccinations on December 17th, he was being handled by someone with close ties to GlaxoSmithKline. We know this because there isn't a health department in America who would not counsel an unvaccinated 18-year-old to first receive a measles vaccine in the middle of the biggest measles epidemic the U.S. had seen in decades. Or offer a chickenpox vaccine, given how dangerous a chickenpox infection could be for a young adult. Or a polio vaccine since they love to say that polio is just a plane ride away, or even a meningitis vaccine since he's headed to college soon. Ethan provided his new shot record to CBS, who then broadcast the vaccinations he received across the screen like an advertisement. Without questioning the missing measles shot, the reporter announced that Ethan had received vaccines for Hep A and Hep B, a flu vaccine, Gardasil, and Tdap. This assortment of vaccines may seem confusing, which is why I personally called Ethan's local health department, which was named on his record that was broadcast on the news. A nurse there relayed to me that the brand of Tdap Ethan would have received was GlaxoSmithKline. And the Hep A and B combo vaccine he would have received was Twinrix, which is made by GlaxoSmithKline. And the flu vaccine he would have received could have been one of a few brands, but two that they carry during a flu season are made by GlaxoSmithKline. But why didn't he receive a meningitis vaccine, since GlaxoSmithKline makes one? Well, that one isn't stocked very often, they said, because Medicaid, which most of their patients use, only covers the Sanofi brand. He probably didn't get the meningitis vaccine because they didn't have it in stock. You might wonder how Merck's Gardasil vaccine fits into this puzzle, since it's not manufactured by GlaxoSmithKline. Well, Merck and GlaxoSmithKline have been in a cross-license and settlement agreement for Merck's HPV vaccine since 2005, so GlaxoSmithKline takes 10 to 18% of the profit of every Gardasil sale. In this one instance, a sale for Merck is a sale for GlaxoSmithKline. It should be no surprise then to hear that on May 15th and 16th, Ethan was featured as a speaker by the Western New York Immunization Coalition, and again by the Finger Lakes Area Immunization Coalition with Dr. Leonard Friedland, Director of Scientific Affairs and Public Health for GlaxoSmithKline Vaccines. These panels consisted of esteemed and educated medical doctors, researchers, a CDC officer, the director of GlaxoSmithKline Vaccines, a GlaxoSmithKline patient advocate who was a meningitis survivor, and, bizarrely, 18-year-old unharmed and mostly unvaccinated Ethan Lindenberger. Ethan's speech at these events was entitled, Truth in a Sea of Lies, what I learned from testifying before Congress at only 18. Judging by the way Jill Wheeler went along with her son's public accusations of being a Facebook anti-vaccine activist who consistently got her clock cleaned by intellectually superior pro-vaccine Facebook users, you would think she would have made hundreds of vaccine posts in the last decade. Yet, in the entire existence of Jill Wheeler's Facebook account, there are only six posts about vaccines. Three of these were in 2015, and three more were in 2016. People who are Facebook friends with Jill have confirmed that all her posts are public, so this is not an instance where there were friends-only posts shielded from public view. On February 12th, Jill appeared with Ethan on a local CBS news show where the reporter said that, about two years ago, Ethan began to see how the posts about vaccines that his own mother was sharing on social media are dangerous. 
CBS then displayed a Facebook post that Jill made in 2015, which was, at the time, over three years old. CBS cut the bottom off the post so that no one could see that it only had one like. When you hover your mouse over the like, you see that it was made by Jill Wheeler herself. In fact, in her interview with The Wild Doc, Jill claimed that her Facebook account could prove that she has shared anti-vaccine information as far back as eight or nine years ago, which is simply false. For whatever reason, Jill Wheeler has never once admitted that she is not, and never has been, an online anti-vaccine activist. She has never admitted that she does not, and did not ever, get into fights with people on any vaccine content that she ever shared. She has never said that her son has been lying to the media, and has never alluded to the fact that he knowingly provided materially false and fictitious information to the U.S. Senate, which is against the law. Jill read Ethan's Senate testimony days before his appearance, and she did not attempt to stop her child from committing a federal crime. On March 6th, Jill appeared on Dell Big Tree's High Wire, an online show that often talks about vaccines. When Dell asked Jill how the pharma industry found Ethan in the first place, she said that she had no clue, but that everything definitely moved very fast. Dell didn't ask at what pace the whole thing moved. He asked how pharma found her kid. Who found him? Like, how did the pharmaceutical no industry find idea. him? No idea. No clue. All I know is everything definitely moved very fast. She made it clear in previous interviews that she and Ethan talked about his decision to get vaccinated in advance and that he did not do it out of rebellion. Remember, Ethan is a loquacious, intelligent, attention-seeking high school senior living at home with his mother. Jill told Dell that she asked Ethan why the media was interested in interviewing him about getting vaccines. She claims that his answer to her question was, I don't know. The next thing I knew was he was telling me, oh yeah, I'm getting interviewed. And I'm like, for what? It's like for getting my vaccinations. And I'm like, what? They're, it didn't make no sense at all. I'm like, why would they interview you because you got, you got your vaccinations, Ethan? That doesn't make sense. Well, I don't know. And I'm like, okay. Jill continues on and explains after Ethan was scheduled for a second interview, she insisted on being interviewed too. Well, then it happened again within like a day. He was getting another one. And I'm like, what are you saying? Because you know I'm against this. Right. And I'm like, well, if you're going to talk, I'm going to talk. I want to talk too. Tell them I want, to, I want them to interview me. But so you said, I want to be interviewed. Oh, I yeah. Want to hear my side yeah. Of the story. I said, I want, to hear, I want them to hear my side of the story. I want them to know why I chose not to vaccinate you. Then she quickly pivoted and said that it was after she saw the second interview, which she says was in the Washington Post that she insisted that she be interviewed for future pieces so that her story was told and her stance was explained. Because then I was starting to see, even on the, the Reddit post and the Washington Post, I think it was the second thing, posted it was, it was, uh, it portrayed me in the light of this crazy mom, this, this, you know, lunatic mom that, you know, that was denying the vaccinations to her children and there were more children to come that might be denied too. Oh gosh, what a terrible mother. And I'm like, oh no, oh no, you're not going there. No, you want to interview him? You're going to interview me too. I'm going to give my side. These two points, Jill's unwillingness to disclose how the media found Ethan and her timeline of when she began giving interviews are concerning. This is because it is easy to find the piece that first broke the Ethan Lindenberger story. It was published on February 6th in Undark Online Magazine and called Coming of Age Unvaccinated. Curiously, the reporter who wrote the story explicitly stated that she interviewed Jill Wheeler, and Jill is also credited with providing the family photo featured in the story. The Undark piece included a few emotional quotes from Jill, which were later repeated endlessly by mainstream media, such as how Ethan's decision to get vaccinated was a slap in the face, and she felt spit on by him. These facts are inconsistent with Jill's claim of having no idea how all of this got started, as well as the picture she painted of not getting involved until at least two interviews had been published already. Jill told Robert Scott Bell on February 14th that she had not turned down one interview. How, how many different news outlets have reached out to you and interviewed you on this story? I think like four okay. or five. And you probably turned down, turned down more than that, though. Yeah. No, I didn't, I didn't turn down any. Oh, you've done every one that's, that's asked so okay. <laughs> yeah. But the reporter in the February 11th Washington Post piece stated that they asked Jill for a comment and that Jill didn't respond. Jill Wheeler is also a stage actress and drama teacher who, for whatever reason, irrationally told Robert Scott Bell that she hates public speaking but is willing to do it when it comes to vaccines. Looking at Undark's Facebook page, they shared their story on Ethan the day it was published, February 6th. 
You might assume it had set off a viral nuclear bomb, given the amount of mainstream media coverage Ethan received in the following days and his invitation to the Senate hearing. Surprisingly, the article only received three shares on the day it was published to Undark's 100,000 followers, and one of those three shares was by Ethan. It's as if no one cared that an 18-year-old legal adult had decided to get some vaccines. In the entire time it's been posted, the Undark article has only been shared 18 times. So how was Ethan propelled to the world stage within 72 hours if his debut article flopped? It's important to note that Undark is funded by the Knight Foundation, which is both a CDC Foundation member and the creator of CDC Journalism Fellowships. Undark may as well be called CDC Magazine. At most, Ethan was working one step away from the CDC in preparation for his February 6th article. On February 9th, Ethan was featured on NPR. By the 11th, he was in the Washington Post, BBC, and People. And by the 12th, he and his mom appeared together on a CBS This Morning program and ABC's Good Morning America. Each story featured the same consistent themes. This child is smarter than his parents, so he's leading them to vaccinations. His mother loves him unconditionally, so his betrayal will only sting for a little bit. And if more states would just lower their age of consent for vaccination, more children just as smart as Ethan could exercise that right, as they should be entitled to do. Three days after Ethan hit mainstream media, Congressman Adam Schiff sent public letters to Facebook and Google telling them, in a roundabout way, to censor vaccine information. People might assume Congressman Schiff was motivated to send the letters because Ethan was in the news, telling the press about his stupid mother who got all of her anti-vax information from Facebook. But we know that Congressman Schiff was not reacting to the Lindenberger story because there was no letter to Twitter, and there never has been. Would you guys restrict someone from sharing info, like false information about vaccines that could get someone hurt? That is not a violation of Twitter's rules, no. Schiff would never risk being rebuked by Twitter in front of the whole world. That means that Schiff's February 14th letters were the end of negotiations with Facebook and Google, not the beginning. These talks had been in the works behind the scenes for months. In the ultimate pharmaceutical coup de grace, despite rebuffing Adam Schiff at the beginning of the year, Twitter granted Ethan access to their executives. This happened after he was packaged as a victim of fake news, along with the father of a child killed at Sandy Hook and a human rights activist who briefs governments on the violations committed against Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar. Shortly after, Twitter began listing health and human services tweets as the top result for searches that included the word vaccine. In February and March, Jill gave several interviews to vaccine education activists, but she slid right through without giving any answers of substance. And I wanted to be able to make a decision for my kids based on what I found, what the information that I, you know, researched. Mm -hmm. I wanted to educate myself. So I started researching, I started reading. So that's when I started digging and I started reading and I got books. Read, research. Read, mm -hmm. research. And I just, I read. I read, I asked around, I read some more, I researched. And so that's what I did, I read. I read a lot. I talked to people, and then I read some more, and then I talked to more people, and then I read some more. So I mean, I got books that were completely for immunizations. I bought books that were completely against. I tried finding books that were neutral. So actually, kind of ironic, I bought books that were completely for immunizations. I got books that were completely against immunizations and then I got books that were kind of in the neutral. <laughs> I read books and it was ironic because I, I wanted to know everything. And that was the big thing is I wanted to educate myself. I wanted to know the who was taught, saying that it was great to vaccinate, who was saying that it not, wasn't good, who was in between. I read, I researched as much as I could and the stuff I found was shocking. And when it was all said and done, I said, Absolutely, absolutely not. This, we are done. We are absolutely done immunizing. The more in depth I got to immunizations, to vaccinations, what they were, what were in them, I, I was shocked. I was, I was shocked. And after reading everything that I did read, I decided that it was absolutely not in my children's best interest to get immunized, to get vaccinated. Okay, but it, it took a long time to get that point. I said, this is not best for my child. On a side note, there's a ton of data done by medical research, a ton of it out there. Um, the stories that I would read, the information I would get and I would find was like, I never knew that. Well, I never knew that either. Well, wait a minute. 
I didn't know this could happen. You know, I didn't know this could happen. And what, what books would you maybe have recommended to him or what websites would you maybe have recommended that helped you that might have made a difference for him? Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> I mean, what's That's a point? hard question because Across three interviews, Jill Wheeler never named one book she ever read and never named one vaccine ingredient that concerned her. Intentionally or not, she stressed that her decision to not vaccinate and her feelings of anger toward Ethan were fear-driven and emotionally based. While Jill complained that mainstream media cut out everything from her interviews except for how proud she was of Ethan, which gave the impression that his decision had her blessing, she continued to provide the same sound bites of pride and unconditional love in interviews with vaccine education activists. She went so far as to tell Robert Scott Bell that she loves that Ethan respected her enough and loved her enough to hide what he was doing from her. Uh, in fact, I love that he respected me enough and loved me enough to try and hide that from me to sure. protect me if he knew how upset I was going to be about it. Just before appearing on Dell Bigtree's show, Larry Cook, founder of Stop Mandatory Vaccination, published a photo of himself having dinner with Jill and older son Isaac. Jill had coincidentally reached out to Larry in the first week of this story going viral. Whether it was well-intentioned or whether it was planned, the Lindenberger family was now directly linked with one of Pharma's biggest problems in social media, Larry Cook. Isaac Lindenberger is a self-proclaimed anarchist and libertarian who devoted most of his Facebook real estate to psychedelic drugs and the existence of other dimensions. Isaac didn't make Facebook posts about his stance on vaccination until February 23rd, which was 10 days before the Senate hearing. When he did post, he was able to combine his man crush on Ron Paul with the hot topic that made his brother famous. True to his newly assigned character of a conspiracy-loving anti-vaxxer, Isaac followed his vaccine post with a request to host a debate on whether the earth was flat, as well as solicit recommendations for conspiracy theorists he should follow on YouTube. Riddled with an already broken moral compass, Isaac turned to parents of vaccine-injured children and asked them to send him money so that he and his brother Noah could attend the Senate hearing to stand up for liberty. Now please note, Isaac was not and never became a witness at the Senate hearing, so how exactly he would stand up for liberty was murky, but he was undeterred nonetheless. Isaac claimed that Ethan's flight, five-star hotel room, and expensive meals were provided by taxpayer money, in contradiction to the Senate's rules for reimbursing witnesses for certain expenses related to testimony. There is no doubt that Ethan got the VIP treatment while in D.C., but those dollars didn't come from taxpayers. For his big day at the Senate hearing, Isaac chose a purple ombre shirt reminiscent of a rodeo clown. As testimony was concluding, Rand Paul was given a few minutes to speak about personal liberty, and when he finished, Isaac stood up and began clapping. This behavior was forbidden in the hearing room, and security had already made that clear to everyone there. But Isaac's applause wasn't about standing up to vaccine mandates. He was clapping because Rand Paul and Ron Paul are two of his personal heroes. I love both Ron Paul and Rand Paul. Ron Paul is the reason I'm even in the liberty movement to begin with. Isaac was clapping because he couldn't contain his joy over getting anti-vaccine activists to pay his way to D.C. to see Rand Paul speak in person. Just two weeks later, Isaac began his pro-vaccine metamorphosis by hosting a scripted debate against his friend and professional dog walker, Ryan Price. Ryan was the first commenter on Isaac's February 23rd vaccine post. To start, you remember when you were in science class and you had the thermometer and it had mercury in it. And if it broke or spilled, it's like, oh, fire alarm, everyone get out and everyone's gonna die. I mean, it wasn't that extreme, but you know, you get that stuff on you, it's dangerous. You might have to go to the hospital. I'm pretty sure that they can actually cause some neurological damage. And the actual transference are different charts. So you have that data? Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, I'd like to see that. That would be great. That's significant. Okay, um, damn, you've, you've really done your homework, dude. Jesus Christ. At the end of this pretend debate, where Isaac claimed his anti-vaccine views were crushed, Ryan suggested, and Isaac supported, the idea that everyone should vaccinate themselves on their own so that the government can't force them to do it. They called their pitch, Vaccinate for Liberty. After the poor reception for his debate, and most likely exhausted by the backlash, Isaac went silent on the subject of vaccines for the next four months. 
But he popped back up again on August 10th with the official announcement that he had researched vaccines and now supported them. He would be getting all necessary shots to bring him up to date, and he'd report back on any side effects. Six days later, Isaac went to get vaccinated, intending to stream it all live on Facebook, but his camera died. He later described how the health department nurse told him all of the ingredients in the six injections he allegedly received for ten diseases. Don't despair. He claimed his only side effect was some redness at the injection site. When called out for the convenient camera phone malfunction, Isaac failed to see how the fact that he brought a dead phone to do a Facebook Live of his injections could possibly be a big deal. When responding to one commenter, he said, I'll take another video next time. Sheesh. The day after Isaac came out in support of vaccines, Jill Wheeler wrote a long, dramatic diary entry for the world to read, foreshadowing the question of which one of her children would be next to betray her. As unstoppable and overwhelming as this tidal wave of political theater was throughout the months of February and March, vaccine education advocates weren't without their breaks. Just prior to Ethan's March 5th appearance before the U.S. Senate, one activist received a screen capture of Ethan's itinerary from a confidential source. The picture listed three people that revealed how highly unusual this situation was. Ethan's itinerary included the name and cell phone number of Amy Pisani, who is the director of Every Child by Two, which is a media and public relations nonprofit organization funded by vaccine manufacturers. One of Every Child by Two's funders, as well as their largest and most expensive project partner, is GlaxoSmithKline. Amy Pisani, in the white blouse and black jacket, is seen in the front row of the hearing, along with Sarah Dupre, in red, who sits on Amy's board. Fascinatingly enough, Sarah spends her time serving as the Director of Government Relations for the Pew Charitable Trust, which is the parent organization of Pew Research Center. Almost 80% of people, according to the Pew Research Center, turn to the internet for health-related questions. Ethan's itinerary screen capture also includes the names of two Senate Help Committee clerks. Andy Vote and Chung Shek. Under his flight times, Ethan noted that Chung would personally be picking him up at the airport the night before the hearing, driving him to his hotel, and then returning Ethan to the airport when the hearing was over. Before you assume he moonlights as an Uber driver, you should know that Chung Shek is no college intern. He's a 13-year veteran of Capitol Hill who spent nine years as Senator Barbara Mikulski's director of operations before moving to the HELP committee. Are you wondering where Chung's former boss stood on vaccines? It's telling that in 2002, the Immunization Action Committee put out a plea for its subscribers. Readers were asked to convince their senators to get on board, supporting a $65 million vaccine funding increase. The group was desperate because, at the time, they had support of only six senators, and Barbara Mikulski was one of them. Mikulski made headlines for her hard-heartedness towards vaccine-injured children in April 2014, when Bobby Kennedy and Dr. Mark Hyman approached her in the hallway, outside of Senate chambers, to talk to her about mercury in the flu shot. The Washington Post described Mikulski as impassive and visibly impatient during the conversation, and that Kennedy had been warned that speaking to her about the danger of mercury in vaccines was a lost cause. The Post described her response as a brush-off that ended with Mikulski suggesting Kennedy speak to Bernie Sanders because Sanders cares about brain health. Her former director of operations, Chung Shek, makes just the briefest appearance on the hearing committee video. He is seen on screen for only four seconds. At the one hour, 41 minute, and 52 second mark, Chung is seen just behind Ethan's back. As Ethan's brother, Noah, begins to walk away, Chung turns and walks behind him. The reason several hundred vaccine education advocates attended the U.S. Senate hearing is because they thought they stood a chance of being one of the 70-something people who would be led into the hearing room. It wasn't until just before the hearing began that advocates in line were told that only 10 seats were available for spectators, because the rest were reserved for guests of the witnesses. The first 10 people in line were allowed to enter, and everyone else stayed outside. These 10 were seated in the back, many along the far wall of the hearing room. When the hearing ended, one advocate kept her eye on Isaac Lindenberger's purple shirt as he immediately made his way toward the exit. She thought it was strange that Isaac, who was not a witness, was stopped from leaving by an Asian man in a suit. I made a Facebook Live the evening of the Senate hearing because I saw an Asian man with glasses and a suit take Isaac into the back room after the hearing. It's the same Asian man that you guys will see at the end of the footage on C-SPAN.
the hearing is over. Isaac is making his way to the door. And then all of a sudden, this weird guy, he looks like a staff. Like, he looks like, like somebody, obviously, with them, but like his handler. That's what he looked like. Remember his handler? So it looked like Isaac's handler. He pulls him to the side and he goes, um, to so, yeah, yeah, he's, he's like, like, he's like, Isaac, come here, come here. Like, he's like, smile, like, Isaac, come here. And, um, and Isaac, he's like, come on, like, hell, what are you doing? Like, come here, like, don't go out there. And at first we thought, hey, he wants Isaac to go through a different entrance to leave because he didn't want Isaac talking to us, right? Because if you walk out the main entrance, everyone was standing there. But that's not what happened. So he pulls Isaac into the room. They talk for like a few minutes. Then Isaac comes back out the room, looking like he's ready for a mission. I'm not kidding, like, 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 kind of like with the face, like, I know what to do, okay? And Isaac walks out of the room, I kid you guys, okay? This man stopped Isaac from walking, remember, he stopped Isaac from walking um, out of the room first, pulled him aside into a double door closed room, then bring, and then Isaac comes out looking like I'm ready to know what I'm, like, like I know what I'm going to do. He then walks straight outside, to talk to all of our people that was standing outside that couldn't get in and was being recorded by everyone. Yet you're going to see videos everywhere of Isaac speaking against his family. A few minutes later, Isaac emerged from the conference room door, made his way to the exit, and met with the hundreds of advocates still in the hallway. Once outside, he launched into a conspiracy theory speech that focused on how Ethan was being used as a tool by the government, which he was more than happy to repeat the following day on Del Big Tree's show. Well, my mom thinks it's very unfortunate that my brother is being used as a tool by the media and by the government. And I think it's really unfortunate that the media and the government have decided to take my brother and use him as a pawn PR stunt for propaganda. Because they picked the wrong kid. But honestly, they picked the wrong kid. If they had picked anyone else, they would be fine. But since they picked my brother and my mom's son... But since they picked my brother, her son... They're going to regret it. They're really going to regret it. And it's going to backlash on them so hard. Because it's going to backlash on them harder than they ever could have imagined. This speech was broadcast live on several Facebook pages and profiles. Obviously, this advocate's description of Isaac being directed by Chung Shek sounds absurd for several reasons. One, Isaac has publicly declared himself to be an anarchist who, at the time, was holding himself up as an anti-vax advocate willing to fight for freedom. Two, Isaac had publicly posted on Facebook that he was attending the hearing to stand up against the propaganda the Senate committee was using his brother for. And three, according to Isaac, who claimed that the government had arranged Ethan's flight, and he's funded with taxpayer money. The Senate committee clerks tried to stop Isaac from attending the hearing at all. I was actually supposed to fly with Ethan here and get picked up by the same ride. When they found out I was coming, they changed his flight information. And then my flight ended up being, I couldn't even end up going on my flight, so then I had to drive. So it's almost like they took every measure to prevent me from coming to stand up for liberty and to make sure my brother was isolated and alone and couldn't be talked to by me or anybody else on the side of his liberty brother. and freedom. His own brother. Right, they tried to stop me from even coming. Isaac's narrative and the advocate's eyewitness testimony can't both be true. If only we had some way of verifying that there is a door at the back of the hearing room, and that it leads to a conference room, and that Chung Shek was inside of it minutes after the hearing ended. In a lucky turn of events, the C-SPAN cameras continued to capture footage for several minutes after the conclusion of the hearing. The senators were long gone and the crowd had cleared out. It is here that we see the ladies from the Every Child by Two team were not your average spectators. We have Amy Pisani chatting with Senate clerks, including Andy Vogt, one of the contacts on Ethan's itinerary. Everyone is all smiles, congratulating themselves on a job well done. They just pulled off the biggest Every Child by Two public relations event of all time. Sarah Dupre, the Every Child by Two chairwoman in red, is being helpful, turning off a microphone on the desk. Amy Pisani gestures to the conference room behind her, and Sarah seems to be waiting around, in no hurry to get anywhere. Off camera, we hear a man and a woman talking near a microphone. What's that? The media stuff, is that happening in China? He's just in the conference room. He's What's that? The media stuff, is that happening in China? He's just in the conference room. The man asks, is the media stuff happening in Chung's office? And the woman says, what's that? He repeats himself, the media stuff. 
Is that happening in Chung's office? And the woman says, he's just in, in this conference room. So although the man was asking where the media event would be happening, the woman answered by telling him where Chung was at that moment. He was in the conference room behind them. But let's not jump to conclusions. Just because we have audio confirmation that Chung was in the conference room at the back of the hearing room at the exact moment our eyewitness claims he was doesn't mean he ever spoke to the defiant oppositional Isaac Lindenberger. But just in case, let's take a look at this cell phone footage filmed in the minutes that the hearing room was emptying out. Here we have what appears to be Chung Shek looking at the phone in his hand. It seems he's received a message, looked up, and says something to a person in front of him. Let's listen in. Chung said, they're on for Isaac. Isaac. Whoever was inside the conference room was ready to talk to Isaac, and they told Chung Shek to bring him in. Without a governmental affairs investigation into the Ethan Lindenberger hoax, we may never know why a high school senior was coached to provide materially false information to the HELP Committee in an attempt to influence the CDC budget, spur state legislation to drop the age of consent for vaccination, and provide the basis for dismantling the largest vaccine information group in Facebook's existence. Should such an investigation take place, surely it would shed light on why this young man was allowed to take credit for Congressman Adam Schiff's censorship of big tech without a single media outlet mentioning the impossibility of Ethan impacting policies in these organizations. Regardless of what happens, GlaxoSmithKline, Every Child by Two, and the Centers for Disease Control hit a home run with the Ethan Lindenberger hoax. Americans learn that children should be free to defy their misinformed, emotionally driven parents and get vaccinated without their permission. Not only will their parents still love them unconditionally, but they will beam with pride when their child stands up for what they believe in. Children will realize that their non-vax parents are making fear-based decisions and are not sharing scientific facts to back their claims, because there are no scientific facts to back their claims. After all, the World Health Organization had already planned that 2019 would be the beginning of adults looking to our youth to lead the way to vaccination. You are listening to the Safe and Effective Podcast, and we'll be right back. And we're back. And remember to go ahead and follow us on Twitter at safe underscore effective. Subscribe to the YouTube channel for the Safe and Effective podcast. And subscribe to my blog on Patreon at patreon.com slash quackenboss. It's for as little as $3 a month or as much as $3 a day, whatever you think is best. And also stay tuned for more podcasts in the near future. Now you did hear a clip there of Isaac and Ryan doing a vaccine debate. It totally sounded legit. Now, we didn't have time to include it, but we did have a confidential source send us an audio file of Isaac and Ryan practicing for that debate. Also totally legit. So, I'm here today to defend my anti-vaxxer stance against my good friend and professional dog walker, Ryan Price. Ryan, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule of hosting birthday parties at the bowling alley and writing maudlin poetry about how your family has rejected you to join me in this riveting discussion today. Yeah, sure, dude. Let's get to it. Hold on. I'm going to take a bong rip. All right. Let's get started. Okay, great. So, first off, Mercury... Remember when our parents used to row it around in their hands if a thermometer broke? Mercury was not poisonous when they were kids. When did it all change? And why are we injected into babies? Aw, dude. 
Mercury is one of the most toxic substances on earth, but the dose makes the poison, so it's far worse to eat sushi than get a flu vaccine. That's why I will never be a pescatarian. Oh, wow. Okay. I never thought about it like that before. Do you have any studies about that? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Okay. I'd like to see that. Gosh. Your ideas are rattling me to my core right now. Okay, next point. The vaccine schedule. When our parents were growing up, they only got like three vaccines. A DPT, polio, and an MMR. Now, we vaccinate for like 16 diseases. What is up with that? Dude, the reason why we get more vaccines today is because more vaccines exist now. These vaccines weren't available when our parents were growing up. Uh, are you serious right now? Do you have a source for that? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Okay, because I'd really like to see that with my own eyes and provide a link for our followers to check that out themselves. I am so glad we were having this really important discussion today. Okay, we have time for only one more talking point, uh, uh, one more thing to talk about. Pharmaceutical corruption. Pharmaceutical companies have paid billions of dollars in fines for unethical behavior like corruption, collusion, and bribery. Why should we trust that vaccines are safe? <sighs> Isaac, vaccines are just different, amigo. They are the greatest health achievement in the history of mankind. We have to look the other way when Merck is fending off lawsuits for falsifying the efficacy of the mumps vaccine at the same time they're on trial for committing fraud, deceit, and negligence during the Gardasil safety trials. If there was something dangerous about vaccines, our government would tell us. I mean, besides the fact they've been considered unavoidably unsafe since the 1960s. Uh, that's a really good point, Ryan. I don't have any choice but to agree with you when you lay it all out like that. All of us anarchists know that the single most important thing we can do is trust the government. It's been great, great having you on today. And I have to say, I feel that my entire belief system has just done a 180 degree shift in this single conversation. That goes to show you the importance of making personal connections. She went so far as to tell Robert Scott Bell that she loves that Ethan respected her enough and loved her enough to hide what was... My God, is that true? That's what she said. <laughs> so did you notice that Noah started laughing when Ethan began listing off all of the reputable sources of his scientific information? <laughs> I did notice that, but I couldn't figure out what Noah was saying, so I asked three of my friends who were deaf. And you know who's not good at lip reading? Mm, who? <laughs> Any of my three deaf friends. <laughs> How did that go for you? Shout out to my crew, my girlies, Brit Brat, Spider Bomb, Bebop, Butterfur, and Virgin Karen. <laughs>